My neighbor is playing very loud music. I don't know where it's coming from. Hopefully he keeps it at bay. <laughs> but you all can't hear it, right? I can't hear it. Okay, good. <laughs> he has eclectic music choices. That's putting it mildly. It's so polite. It's wonderful. That's why I love my street.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's class um, from the Preservation Resource Center of New Orleans. My name is Danielle Del Sol. I'm the Executive Director, and we're very excited that you're joining us tonight for how to evaluate a historic property for pre-purchase. There's a lot of material to cover tonight, and if you're interested in buying a property right now in New Orleans or anywhere that's more than 50 years old, um, you, there are a lot of things that you need to know. And tonight you're gonna learn from an incredible realtor here in New Orleans, Josh Walther, and Gabby LeBlanc, who is a home inspector with Axelrad, um, also here in New Orleans. So they are here ready to tell you all the things you need to know as you evaluate possibly buying a historic property, whether it's something that you know is going to have to get down to the studs for renovation or something that you think might be turnkey, but you really do need to get into the nitty gritty to figure out what it is that you're going to make an offer on. So we have all that coming up in the next few minutes. Um, before we get to that, I wanna thank our sponsors tonight. I wanna to thank all the major donors and members of the Preservation Resource Center. Um, your generosity makes our online programming, which we've been able to offer for free throughout this whole pandemic, um, possible. We're very grateful for your continued support. And for those of you who aren't members, we highly encourage you to check out membership to the PRC. A membership starts at just $35 for a whole year. And in exchange for that, you get a wonderful award-winning magazine, Preservation in Print, delivered to your mailbox nine times a year, discounts on all of our fabulous merchandise, and much more. Um, so check us out, prcno.org. You can sign up for a membership there, make a donation if you feel so inclined. You can also shop. We've got great merchandise. We've got really great face masks with New Orleans historic architecture, of course, on them. Um, we have tote bags, great t-shirts, and our coffee table book right behind me. Um, um, you can check it out. It's a wonderful gift or it's a wonderful gift to yourself. Um, it's uh, $50 for members right now. So another incentive to sign up for membership is, is great discounts like that. Um, as you all know, the Preservation Resource Center was founded in 1974 to protect and revitalize New Orleans historic architecture, neighborhoods, and cultural identity. Um, and all of what we do is, is made possible thanks to the generosity of our members and donors. Tonight, I want to especially thank uh, Bellwether Technology for their generosity in supporting the Preservation Resource Center and making tonight's programming possible. So now that we've got that out of the way, let me explain how tonight will work. If you are joining us via Zoom, you can see us, but we cannot see you. However, we still want to communicate with you. So if you look on the bottom of your screen, you have two buttons. One says we have more than two, but the two that you can use to communicate with us are chat, and Q&A. In either box, you can type a question, an observation, something you want me to ask the presenters. And what we'll do is both Josh and Gabby will take time to present tonight, and then we'll end the, the session with about 10 to 15 minutes um, so that I can ask them all of your questions. I, I will be moderating the chat box, and I will relay your questions to them tonight. So. Um, let me go ahead and introduce our two speakers. Josh Walther is um, a part owner of the Witchery Collective and a realtor. Uh, what's fabulous about both of our presenters tonight is that they have really fascinating backgrounds um, and they're very, um, uh, they've been doing what they, do, they are now doing for a long time. They are truly experts. We're lucky to have them, but they also come from really interesting places. Um, Josh is originally from New Jersey and he started his professional career actually as a professional um, horse trainer and spent many years representing the United States equestrian team all around the world. Um, he stopped that after a few years and then lived in several cities abroad, um, including Rome, before he returned to the United States and settled in New Orleans in 2002. After witnessing the devastation of Hurricane Katrina, Josh felt a great commitment to his surrogate city and decided to help other residents rebuild their lives by becoming a licensed realtor. So after 12 years, Josh is still energized every day by what he does. And um, now as a part owner of the collective, they are represent amazing properties all over the city. He's truly an abundance of knowledge um, right here in our midst. So thank you, Josh, for joining us. Um, before I turn it over to you, I also want to introduce Gabby. Gabby LeBlanc is a West Bank native, um, so she is born and bred uh, New Orleans. 
Um, Gabby actually started her professional life um, in kinesiology and was a personal trainer at a gym for 10 years, which is just fascinating. Um, she became really interested in um, home inspections after watching a home inspection on her own first house. Um, and she became involved with the St. Bernard Project, which is another local nonprofit, and was their assistant carpenter for six months. Um, in 2013, Gabby became a fully accredited home inspector, and she's now working with Axelrad, which is, as many of you know, one of the most um, well-respected home inspect inspection companies in the region. So Gabby, also a wealth of knowledge and a very interesting person, and we're very glad to have both of you here tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh, who is going to begin tonight's presentation. Josh, take it away. Thank you, Danielle. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the virtual class. Um, I'm gonna have to pick up one of those face masks this week, I believe. Um, so if you wanna start with the slideshow, off we go. So um, I like to, this, this is an infographic that it doesn't necessarily pertain to any specific property, but in the beginning, I like to sort of give an overview of what I'm seeing in the current marketplace. Um, as I mean, as we all know, uh, we live in the time of COVID. And uh, when that hit mid-March, mid-March is usually our busiest time as a real estate uh, brokerage because it's, it's the spring market, so to speak. And um, with COVID hitting, Basically, everything came to a halt. It came to a halt for everybody, of course. But we, we went from going to from maybe 10 to 12 showings a day to maybe one or two. Um, but come mid-May, all of a sudden, the market overnight picked up. It went, I, I think it was a combination of people, you know, had maybe taken new jobs or, or what have you. And, and they all of a sudden were, were saying to themselves, I have to move. COVID or not, I have to move. So we, uh, again, I went from just sort of doing one or two appointments to 10, 15 a day, and the market just really picked up. There is also, we have historic low interest rates, and that is also a big driver between, behind um, what we experienced, you know, basically early summer, so to speak. Um, but basically what buyers were looking for was, and, and partially this is due to COVID, people were were both maybe both spouses working from home, they had their children at home, um, and they, they realized, I need more space. I, I can't do this. People were busting at the seams. So uh, looking for more square footage inside and outside. Um, you, again, you have homeschooling, you have home offices that are needed. But in some cases, and this has happened to me a couple times this spring, the in-laws have decided to come down and help out, which is fantastic, of course. Um, but people, you know, not everybody wants to live exactly under the same roof. So sometimes people are looking for multifamilies or something like that, where everybody had their own space. But um, on, the whole, on the whole, that was a, a big driver. Um, secondly, I experienced uh, a lot of parents were realizing that this historic low interest rate was the time to get their children into the housing market. So what they were trying to do is, you know, help them with their down payments and get them in on around 4%, below 4%, which is quite, quite low, just so that they could you know, pick up a piece of real estate for their own. On the flip side, the sellers are, in some cases, believe it or not, they had too much square footage. And if, you know, with COVID and people not working and you know, maybe they had help with gardeners or what, whatever they had, um, the property became too much to manage personally. So you would see sellers that would just say, uh, so to speak, uncle, I can't do all of this anymore. And um, so they basically figured out it's time to downsize. Um, of course, unfortunately, people lost their jobs. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And the uh, real estate itself, the property itself, you know, if they have equity in it, it might be the best time to cash out and sit on some money. Um, which, you know, if you can, real estate is great. If you can, if you can purchase a property and stay in it for five to seven years, because real estate, again, is a market. It goes up and down, just like anything else. Uh, you usually can turn around with some equity in it, especially if you buy a house to renovate and then renovate it fully, you know, then now you're competing with properties in excellent condition. So that's another thing I've saw. And then lastly, 
we weren't really traveling. Um, so people that had second and third homes here w couldn't come. <laughs> so they basically decided, well, hey, you know, maybe it's time to let this go. So, um, and then lastly, one thing that actually happened this spring, a couple, or I keep saying spring, I'm sorry, the spring market basically shifted into the summer. So uh, last thing I saw is people don't, are not sort of handcuffed to their office anymore. They're allowed to work from home. And I probably had two or three sales where people were like, well, if I can work from home, I wanna live in New Orleans. I don't wanna live where I live. So it was, it was interesting to have a couple of those sales and they were so excited to finally be living in New Orleans, living their sort of dream city and still being able to work. So that was, that was just, a, it, was a very, it was a very interesting spring slash summer, um, but our, our spring market definitely happened this summer. Um, all right, but next slide, please. Okay, assessing, assessing your readiness to renovate. Um, this is, these are basically the questions you should ask yourself. I mean, do you have any experience in reno, renovating? I mean, physically, do you have experience in it? Uh, I mean, renovating is literally from painting to putting up crown molding or all the way to ripping out a kitchen, <laughs> retiling, all of that. Um, so, you know, you just figure out who you are in that process. Are you just interested in it or are you ready just to dive in? Um, and then the next question is always a great one. Are you suited to take on a renovation project? This is the one I'm always saying, please be honest with yourself. Uh, we live in the time of HGTV and they will renovate a bathroom within a half an hour. That's not real. <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody knows that. So, you know, be honest with yourself. Are you ready to put in some blood, sweat and tears? Are you, you know, you have to be ready for a little bit of disappointment here and there. You never know. It, not, nothing ever goes exactly as planned. Um, my, my next question uh, for the renovator is, you know, are you capable of doing some work? Painting is great. Demolition, of course. Uh, at the Witchery Collective, we start with all of our buyers with a, uh, a sit down. We call it a buyer session. And in the buyer session, we, we, first of all, we just sort of greet each other and sort of get comfortable with each other before we go look at property together. Uh, we learn about your criteria, your wants, your needs, um, and, and if you want to renovate or not. Um, if there's all certain, there's all, excuse me, there's all different levels of renovation. Um, and sometimes at these buyer sessions, people will say, oh, I just want to renovate, make it my own. And then I'll show them property in poor condition. And they look at me and they're like, oh, that's, that's way too much. So, you know, you just sort of have to find your happy medium. Of course, you can hire uh, general contractors and stuff, but there's some things you can take on yourself to save some money. Um, the next one is about, do you have time to manage a project? If you are doing any sort of renovation, you need to be on site daily. It is very important. You have to make sure that, you know, as, if you go to, as you go to work or something and somebody's working on the project for you, you have to walk through every night uh, when you are done with work, just to make sure the punch list of the day was done properly. Um, so, something as simple as uh, the thermostat box. For some reason, uh, uh, general contractors and their uh, subs love to put that right in the middle of a wall. And that, that's one of those things where if you just move it a foot and a half closer to the door frame, you can use that whole wall for art. You know, those are the silly little things, but it's one of those things that we walk through and you're thinking, well, we can do a little better than that, you know? So I always say, um, and I will freely admit, I'm, I'm renovating my own home. Um, and I never missed a day. I walked around with a, uh, a roll of blue tape, the uh, painter's tape, and just put it on everything that's a little bit off. It's a great tip. Um, also, it brings up the discussion for the next day when you talk to your general contractor, because um, some things do get lost in translation. Uh, and then lastly, this is very important. Um, do you have a safe house? And who is your support network? Um, the safe house is, could also be known as couch surfing. Um, if you are doing a renovation, things take time and sometimes things are out of your control. If you give up your rental unit, so, uh, for example, on the 30th of the month and your house is not ready on the 30th, what are you going to do for the next 15 days till it's ready? 
you need to you need to think of all of this right you know this has to be right at forefront in your mind about am i going to be okay and less stressed out if i have a place to at least crash for a couple of days you know you can put your stuff in the house you can put it in a room and shut that room off you know that's fine but you need to also you know stay well rested and stay on your job on point so to speak um, I know with a couple of the jobs that my clients are working on right now, because of COVID, um, the like, like appliances are delayed and um, the price of lumber has gone up due to COVID. There's a lot of outside factors that are coming into play in our current um, situation. And um, you, you just need to be ready, be ready for that and um, you, you know, be able to lean on your support network, network as well. Uh, next slide, please. Why renovate? This is a great question. Um, the personal challenge, for sure. Um, renovation is, is a very challenging thing. Uh, the, again, it, I'll go back to HGTV. You get to watch a lot of people, you know, walk through different houses and things of that manner and think, well, maybe I can do this. So that's great. You know, of course, that, that, that's, a wonderful, um, that's a wonderful reason. That's a good enough reason in my world. Um, what exactly are you renovating for? Is this for investment or an equity builder? Are you going to renovate a double uh, and, and collect rent off of that double or maybe even move into that double, uh, the shotgun double and uh, move into that one side and, and be the owner occupant and then realize that maybe in a couple of years, you're gonna keep that double, put it into your real estate portfolio and keep collecting rent off of that while you move on to you know, either your, your next project or maybe you've now had a family and you want a single family home. Um, you know, all, all of those are, are, are reasons to think about why you're doing this. Um, why renovate? Also, New Orleans, we have some very old housing stock. Uh, that is the, one of them, that's part of the reason I live in this city. This city is, we have architecture here that just doesn't exist anywhere. Uh, and that is, I just feel so fortunate to, to live in this city. I always sort of joke that if I'm ever having a bad day, I put my phone down and I go walk in the garden district for a minute and just remember, oh, this is such a beautiful city. My life is just fine, you know? Um, and then you wanna, next question would be like, you know, do you wanna personalize a home to fit your needs? That could be as simple as a floor plan that could be as simple as do you run a, do you want to you know start a catering business and you need a massive kitchen with lots of countertops i mean there's so many elements that are personal but that's the reason you want to renovate your home or maybe you're living in a um, shotgun double and your family has grown but you love your block and you don't want to leave well maybe you need to modify the floor plan a little bit um you know i understand that and you know, renovation is the best way to achieve what you want in a property. Um, the, the next one is always fell in love with a house or a neighborhood. I mean, that's exactly why I'm sitting in the house I'm sitting in right now. I uh, used to rent on this street and a friend of mine owned the house I live in now. I, I fell in love with this block, great neighbors. Uh, I live in the Irish Channel and I could just walk to magazine get a cup of coffee, get dinner, you know, see some friends. I loved all that. So the house that my friend owned was a rental and I had a little vision and I came in here and just, you know, put down some wood floors, did a little this, little that, and I'm super happy here. So yeah, I fell in love with the neighborhood, not exactly the house, but I made the house what I wanted. Um, and again, you know, love the historic architecture. I mean, I was just talking about how I can walk into the garden district from here. Um, and, and a lot of people want to live in a historic district. They want to preserve what we have. Uh, that's that's the, one of the best re uh, reasons to renovate. Um, and then also lastly, uh, I want to help with remove blight. There's still some, a lot of blighted houses in this city post Katrina. Um, and what better way than to just repopulate this city with and renovate some homes and sell them? to people who want to achieve the dream or get to buy their first house. Um, there's also, as, as New Orleanians say, this city sort of lives block by block. And a lot of the houses on the block maybe have been completely renovated and moved into, but there might be always, there's always sort of one sort of 
sore thumb, so to speak. And if that house comes up and is for sale, it, you know, maybe that's your chance to renovate that house, improve your block and, um, you know, achieve what you've started and make your neighborhood just, or your street, your block, your neighborhood, just one house better. Um, next slide, please. Um, I always love to put in a couple pictures here and there. I think people love it. I love it. So I do it. <laughs> um, so this is what clients of mine did this house. It was a fun project. Uh, obviously the left is uh, right when they purchased the property. The right hand picture is the finished product. Um, next slide, please. The, so the left side is the interior. This is the before, obviously. Um, they've obviously done some demolition in the lower picture. Um, you're, you're, this, this, is, this is a renovation all the way to the studs, obviously. But on the right-hand side, this is your finished product. They were able to keep the floors, stain them, bring them right back but then modernize the property with the quartz countertops and you know, the crisp white kitchen, uh, beautiful bathroom, marble, double-headed shower. I mean, it just turned out beautifully and it was, it was a nice project to be a part of. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how, do I, how to look for and identify a good project. Um, I always say work with a realtor to view homes and the neighborhood trends. Don't forget we are in the, car pretty much all day long and we are in and out of all the neighborhoods uh it's not unheard of for me to be in the river bend to the bywater back up to you know mid city i mean we're just running around all day long showing property and i think it's smart to ride the coattails with somebody who is in and out of the neighborhoods we know changing blocks or we notice um i always say it's sort of dangerous to drive behind me because if i see a brand new renovated house i'm gonna almost hit the brakes um because i want to know exactly what block i'm on and what's going on um looking for a project you know look for foreclosures uh look for homes that have been rentals so that's exactly what i purchased you know that is a great way to get into a neighborhood that you know maybe was full of renters at one point but it's slowly turning into homeowners well you know this might be your opportunity to uh, go into a home change it into a primary residence if that's what you're trying to achieve um, but you know we have great bones in our properties down here and if you can strip back some of the stuff you're going to have a wonderful home when you're finished um, and i i love going into dated homes with clients once you get over the pink tile and the or pink and mint green tile and the, uh, you know, old Formica countertops, you know, you can, if you can share a vision together, um, you can turn a dated home into a masterpiece. Uh, I always try to tell clients, you know, when you're looking for homes to renovate, go to open houses. Because if you can see houses that have been renovated recently, you, it'll help you uh, create vision of what you can do with this space. Um, you know, knocking down a wall. Wow. Okay. Now I have a, a way more open floor plan. I mean, simple things like that, you know, don't let that impede your, what you purchase. You can do it yourself. You just need to sort of get, get, get some ideas and hopefully your, uh, real realtor has, um, helped people along the way and they can sort of help you, uh, bring it to fruition. Uh, the next one is the most truthful thing I can tell you. Look at realistic projects with a realistic budget. Um, when you are pricing out a renovation project, you have to be realistic about what your needs are. Um, it, you, I mean, there's simple things as um, a, like a spigot on a stove. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, not a stove, on a sink. Um, you know, you don't have to go with the top of the line one right now. Just fix your kitchen and you can always come back and visit that one because then you're not, you're not blowing up the budget and then you're over budget. You need to have a contingency in your budget in order to achieve what you want, but there's always going to be a little bit of a can of worms that you need to be ready for. Uh, what do you need, you know, what are your needs and what, again, this goes back to what are your needs and what are your, excuse me, what are your wants? Um, in, in some cases, 
are you just buying a double property to rent it or do you want to move in half? You know, what is your need there? Um, this is the most important thing as well. Be aware of what is surrounding your property. Always walk the blocks, do things of that manner. Um, you know, be careful if you're buying the only single family home on a block full of doubles because you, you're the, and, you, and maybe if you don't have parking, because you're going to be competing against all those people to park. Um, so just keep that in mind. You know, be very aware of what is surrounding your property. Uh, again, drive by several times a day, the night, walk the block, talk with neighbors. I mean, this is New Orleans. Talk with the neighbors, they'll tell you everything. There's always one person sitting on their porch or pulling back their curtain or whatever. When you pull up, that's the person you want to talk to. They know exactly what is going on. And this is New Orleans. Again, people love to talk. Um, always maybe go to the NOPD website, look up your crime stats there, um, you know, stalk the property a little bit here and there. But there's also the uh, Next Door Neighbor app. You can always jump on that and see what's going on in the neighborhood or the neighborhood groups or group meetings. Uh, fantastic way to do your homework on the property you're considering purchasing. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just some random photographs that I took from just some things that you should think about when you're purchasing a home. Um, I will freely admit the one on the left is my house. That, that is a breezeway between my house and my neighbor's house that is completely useless. I can barely get down it. <laughs> but again, I wanted the location and luckily I have a bigger gate on the other side um, to access my back courtyard. But you know, I didn't think of that when I bought the house. And then now that I have it, I, I'm thinking, well, that is completely useless, that gate. I don't even know why it's there. Um, and then further down my street, this is the, prop, uh, the photo on the right, is an example of a house that is basically built right on top of a house. I mean, there, we're talking maybe eight inches there. So think about this. If you had to fix the siding along that house, how are you going to do it? I mean, that's a very, very... Um, skinny person, so to speak. <laughs> and um, so you have to think a little bit outside of the box because placement on the lot and the lot line is very, very important. Um, luckily, this one does not go down very deep. You can see the daylight at the end of the, uh, the little hollow in the middle. But you know, some of our properties are built right on the, the lot lines. So you have to make sure that if something were to uh, go wrong, uh, you know, have it be the roof or the siding or gutters or what have you, um, you can access it. That's super, super important. Or if you are renovating, you know, can you make a modification to this so that therefore you do have full access? That's, that's, that's a very big consideration you should take into play. Next slide. Uh, Orleans Parish Assessor website. Um, I am a big fan of this website. You can go onto this website to see who owns the property but there's also a tab on the right hand side called parcel map viewer. And it clicks on that and it highlights, as you can see the properties highlighted in orange here. Um, that's, let, let's say that's your focus property. That's actually my house, but I can click all around the house to find out A, uh, does the owner of the property who pays the taxes live in town? Could, could this just be an investment for them? or, um, you know, it, it, it's a nice way to figure out, you know, who's a homeowner, who's a renter, who lives out of town completely, or who just lives across the city. Um, I'm a huge, huge fan of this website. I think it's very, very helpful. Um, it also will tell you zoning, it will tell you all kinds of um, exceptional stuff. But I think li literally to figure out who is your immediate neighbor, this is such a great site to figure that out. Um, you know, learn what is basically around you. Next slide, please. And how to determine value. Well, if you're working with a real estate agent, they will definitely be able to pull up comps for like properties, whether it's square footage, bedrooms, um, one story, two story, you know, straight shotgun, double, what have you. Um, you know, the properties, the comp value is how you basically determine price. Uh, or purchase price as well. 
Um, that's different than the assessed value, which the assessed value is done by the um, city of New Orleans. So that doesn't mean if you see assessed value that is below what you're paying, it's not the same thing. The assessed value is what the city charges, uh, bases taxes off of, where, you know, an appraised, you know, and sometimes the assessed value has not caught up to the neighborhood, so it's a little bit below value. Uh, the appraised value is what you will achieve, you know, when you purchase the home. Uh, location, physically, how, and this is great, just back to that one picture we were just talking about a second ago with that house right on the lot line and so narrow. Physically, how, where does it sit on the lot itself? Do you, you know, do you have access but down both sides? Is it in the middle of the lot? Is it on the front of the lot? If it's on the front of the lot, hopefully you have a big backyard. You know, what, what do you want out of the property? Well, just look at how it sits. Um, back, back to block, you know, New Orleans is a block by block city. Again, reach out to that neighbor sitting on the porch who's paying attention. She'll be able to tell you what's going on there. Um, the size of the house, of course, that's, that's more of a personal thing in the layout. Uh, you know, you can change that when you do renovate. Um, you know, are you looking for a single or a multifamily? You know, what size fits your needs? And if you, what can you do to that property to make it fit your needs? Uh, again, it could be just knocking down a, one quick wall and you've got exactly what you want. Or even putting up a wall. I have a client who just recently had an enormous living room and um, she needed a home office where well, she erected walls and boom, she's done, but she didn't have to move. But that, that's, just, that's, that's not a full on renovation, but that's a renovation. She put that effort into that house to make it her own. Um, the amenities with, uh, near the property, we are in the time of Uber and Lyft, you know, so, you know, do you, are, do you want to walk to, let's say Magazine Street, for, for example, you know, do you want to be close to that? And then you might not have as much yard if you were then versus like Lakeview. But hey, you have the ability to hop in an Uber and stuff. So that's changed up a little bit. But some people still want the more urban life closer to coffee shops, dinner, or what have you. Um, so think about that. It's not just the property itself. It's, it's what's around the property that intrigues you, that makes you want to, um, you know, live there. Uh, and of course, the condition of the, pro the subject property before and post renovation. When you look at houses in average, even in poor condition, um, you kind of have to put on the goggles and say, you know, what can I do with this one? And not take the literal condition of the property too seriously if you know you're going to renovate because um, you, you can get overwhelmed. But I, you know, it's nice to see properties, that, the before and afters, that's why I do share those pictures. I think it's nice to see that this is possible for anybody. You know, you just have to uh, be well guided and uh, consider what you can put into the property itself to make it your own. Uh, next slide, please. Oh good, more pictures. So this is a house, the, the lower photos are a house that, um, I showed many years ago that was dated and the even you can see that <clears throat> excuse me just the closet in the lower one in the bathroom just was unnecessary in this property and if you look at the photo above you know they tucked the toilet in there they redid the vanities um, you know we live in the age of the internet you can buy vanities all kinds of stuff at great prices online you, um, kitchens as well, uh, you know, this kitchen was very, very tight, a little galley kitchen we had originally, opened up a wall and look, I mean, look, look how lovely and big that, that, uh, that kitchen is. So, you know, a modern update can be just that easy, but just to have the vision, I mean, the, the upper set of photos, I mean, what a great, great bathroom. Um, next slide. Uh, this is a home that was on Josephine and Camp Street. I believe the PRC did one of their happy hours here. Um, this home is not far from where I live and it was a multifamily. I, I, I wanna venture to say there was maybe six apartments in this home and it was getting really run down, but you could just tell this was a gem. It was such a gem. Uh, and some preservationists bought it and they turned it into just a beautiful, beautiful property. And unfortunately, I need to go back and take a picture of the completed home so I can add that to my next year's slideshow. Um, that's all for me. I'm going to turn it over to Gabby. Gabby, 
works with Axelrad. She's a wonderful home inspector. She's going to point out a few ideas that just, uh, when you're looking at a property, what to take into consideration just from walking around. Take it away, Gabby. All right, hey guys. Um, so yeah, I work with Axelrod and Associates Home Inspections. Um, basically, if you haven't had a home inspection before, um, our company will come out with usually multiple inspectors. We won't be there any longer than two hours. Um, and we'll split up and we'll, we'll take certain sections of the home and we'll inspect those all the way from the foundation all the way up to the roof, interior. Uh, we'll take pictures of everything and, um, and write up a comprehensive report and we'll email it to you within a few days. Um, so basically I'm here today to try to teach you in a nutshell how to somewhat inspect a home. So you could um, gather as much information as you can um, so you can make an informed decision on your investment. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. So here's what we'll be talking about today. Um, first, I'd like to say that I want you to think about the house or a house as a system. Um, so you have multiple components that all work together and affect one another. So we'll be talking about the roof, the structure, foundation, exterior, electrical, HVAC, plumbing, insulation and ventilation and interior. Um, now for historic homes, they were built and designed before HVAC, before insulation and ventilation were used. So these homes were designed to breathe. Um, issues um, began to happen when people try to uh, tighten the home so that um, they are airtight and they can't breathe and that starts to cause moisture and mold issues and uh, among other things. Um, so there are ways to preserve this historic design while also you know living a modern lifestyle. Um, we can go to the next slide, slide please. Um, so first we'll talk about roofing. Um, uh, the majority of the roofs that we see today um, are asphalt, so we'll be focusing mostly on asphalt roofs today. Um, but just to kind of go through a few and, and some common issues with asphalt, um, whenever you start to see the exposed fiberglass, if you take a look at a roof from the street and you see a, a shininess to it, that's typically the exposed fiberglass reflecting. That is usually when it's showing its age. Um, it'll start showing the fiberglass when it's about 10 years old. Um, and you have uh, different types of asphalt roofs. So you have a seal tab, which is a three taps shingle. That'll have a life expectancy of about 15 to 20 years. Whereas an architectural asphalt shingle, that's one of the more thicker and more three dimensional um, shingle, that'll um, last more like 20 to 25 years. So that's how you can kind of gauge um, the lifespan of the roof and where it is in its life. Um, with slate, um, you, you'll usually see cracked and broken tiles from the street if that's where you inspect it. If you could get closer to the roof and put a ladder up on the edge, that would be even better. There's a lot you can't really see from the street. Um, or even get binoculars, that would be um, another good tool. Um, there's also synthetic slate that I see a lot in the French Quarter that happened a lot after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and there are certain ways to determine where there is a defective synthetic slate, uh, which is really important because that might involve replacing the roof. Um, it's really hard to repair that type of slate tile um, because if you walk on it, you'll just damage more, shing more uh, tiles. So it's really important to know the difference. Um, metal, uh, what's popular these days is the, um, the concealed fastener system of the metal roofs. Um, that way you don't have, that's the main issue with the metal roofs. It's not the metal uh, the sheet metal, it's more the fasteners that'll fail first. So when you can conceal those fasteners, that would um, allow uh, for less maintenance um, and it'll um, uh, lengthen the lifespan as well. Uh, but when you have the exposed fastener system, um, you'll have um, these hex bolts with neoprene or rubber uh, washers 
it's those washers that'll fail before the sheet metal itself. And you'll have to regularly, um, probably every few years, um, you know, inspect those washers and make sure they're holding up. If not, water will get in between that and the fastener. Um, flashing is very important for roofing. Uh, flashing is basically typically a metal material, um, but it can be other materials. It's a way to sh properly shed water so it doesn't cause water intrusion and damage. Um, so having flashing um, at the edge of a roof, um, it's called drip edge flashing to prevent it from causing damage to the fascia. And then you have other flashings like sidewall flashings and around chimneys, uh, basically around all of the vulnerable areas. Um, so we also inspect for that. You'll a lot of the times see flashings begin to rust um, and that'll be, uh, you know, the time that it needs maintenance or replacement. Um, Trees are a very common issue with, with roofs as well. Um, they can cause a lot of abrasion, as you can see in these pictures. Um, the one on the right, that is the worst tree, da tree damage um, that I've seen in my career. Um, but that's definitely a very long time of trees rubbing against the shingle, uh, but eventually it can cause that damage. Um, so keep an eye on any trees that are touching the roof. Um, you'll likely have some damage there. Um, go to the next slide, please. So here is some tips on how to gauge the age of a roof. Um, the one on the left, that is an asphalt seal tab, the three tab shingle I was telling you about. So you can see the shininess. That is the exposed fiberglass. So that one is probably close to the end of its life. I would say that's probably, I mean, it's 20 years old, but yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely getting up there. Um, the one on the right, that is an architectural asphalt shingle. So that um, is about halfway through its life. Um, you can't really see the exposed fiberglass just yet. Um, and and uh, so that, that's how you can kind of gauge um, the ages. Look for that fiberglass um, being exposed. That picture on the right, that um, you can see the lead boot, the lead flashing on that plumbing vent. Um, that, for some reason, squirrels just love to chew on these things. If you have any, <laughs> if you have trees near your roof, you can almost guarantee that you'll have damage to these plumbing vents. I think they like to sharpen their teeth on them, but I'm not sure. But I, it's, it's almost guaranteed that you'll see damage to a plumbing vent if you have trees close to the roof. Um, but basically all that repair involves is slipping off that top half and putting a new one on. It's a very simple repair, um, but you wouldn't know that un unless you went look onto the roof. So just make sure you regularly, you know, inspect these areas. Um, but, but yeah, um, you really want maintenance done to your asphalt shingle roof every three to five years. Uh, so just get a roofer out there to inspect, uh, seal up exposed nail heads, um, and check the flashings, make sure they're not rusted and, you know, patch shingles and, and replace these, um, these flashings and that sort of thing. But, um, but yeah, that's an asphalt roof. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So now we'll talk about structure and foundation. Um, so the foundation is a very important component of a house. Um, typically with the historic homes you'll see a brick pier foundation. So just to kind of paint a picture for you, you have um, a footer under the brick pier, then you have your brick pier, and then you have a wooden sill on top of the piers. Um, those are usually six inches by six inches. Then on top of that, you'll have your floor joists going across the sills. And those are typically two by tens, two by twelves. And then you have your, your subfloor on top of that. So, so, um, so what you really want to look for whenever you walk up to the house is the condition of the brick piers. A lot of the times you'll see the mortar between the bricks beginning to, uh, to deteriorate. Um, the, the easiest repair for that is called tuck pointing, where you reapply the mortar between the bricks. 
I would prefer to see appear top pointed rather than encapsulated, which is basically covering the whole pier with mortar because bricks need to breathe. They're basically like sponges. And whenever you cover them and uh, restrict the air from them, they'll begin to deteriorate even more. Um, so if you can leave the bricks exposed and only tuck point um, between them, that would be much better. Um, now, also with the foundation, there's a difference between a uh, house being level and stable. Um, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on the next slide. But just because you walk into a house and you can feel a lot of movement doesn't necessarily mean that there's something seriously wrong. Um, so what most people will do is fix the issue and stabilize the foundation rather than actually level it. Because whenever you bring leveling into the issue, you can cause a lot of damage to the interior finishes, like the flooring and the drywall and paint and so on. So don't be too alarmed if you see that, but it's always a good idea to get um, the measurements of the settlement, which we do with um, this tool called a zip level. And I'll have some drawings on the next slide for you, but it's a good idea to have those measurements, but um, as well as a full inspection of the crawl space, uh, the foundation and the structure to determine whether it's stable. So something can be seven inches out of level, but completely stable. So it's important to know those things. Um, we're also going to talk about the difference between rot and insect damage. Insect damage is typically most common in this area is from termites. Um, and they have different types of termites too. Um, and I'll kind of try to teach you on how to, um, how to notice the, the difference between the two. Um, another um, indication of settlement um, is if you see racked frames like doors and windows, um, if they're not perfectly square, that's usually uh, the first place you'll see movement um, is in the openings in the walls. So that's something else that you want to keep an eye on. Also, if you're, if you're able to look at the roof and you see depressions or wavy, um, like, uh, or waviness in the roof, the, the whole frame settles together. So if the foundation settles, the roof framing will also settle. So if you see depressions in the roof, sometimes that can be an indication of foundational settlement, or it can just be isolated to a rafter issue. Maybe there's just damage to the roof structure. Um, but all, all important things to keep an eye on. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so here are the drawings of the measurements of the foundation level. So the house on the left, it's a little single shotgun. Um, the overall differential is three and a half inches from the highest point to the lowest point. If you look at the facade in that picture, you could almost see it drop from left to right. Um, and and that, that is obvious in the, the measurements as well. And I walked up to it and I immediately saw that. But you also have to keep in mind that that distance isn't very long. Uh, so it's more obvious. Um, now the average settlement for a raised house in New Orleans is about three and a half inches. So that house is actually right at the average. It just looks more obvious because it's a smaller footprint. Um, now the one on the right, um, this one had a lot of structure and foundational issues. This is probably the largest differential that I've seen in my career, 14 and 14.1 uh, inches. Um, but there are other things that we look for in these measurements. Um, if it drops about three inches within about 10 or 15 feet, that usually is an indication that something serious may be going on and it's worth looking at. Um, so we'll take a closer look at the foundation in that area. Um, it could be old damage, um, but that is something to, to definitely look at. Um, there are a lot of things that could cause settlement. Most of the time, it's moisture related, uh, whether that's poor site drainage, um, if you have, if it floods a lot on the site and it doesn't um, adequately flow to the street, um, 
or a lot of the times it's sewer leaks, especially underground sewer, um, sewer leaks. That's why it's always important to have a video plumbing inspection. Um, they'll actually put a camera through the pipes underground and um, inspect their condition. Um, there, are also, there are also things that we look for as inspectors above ground that are sometimes indications of sewer leaks. Um, like if you see sinkholes in the ground, sometimes that could be an indication of a sewer leak. Um, among among other uh, among other signs, um, as far as sewer leak goes, but site drainage um, is also very important. Um, so having gutters and downspouts, subsurface drains um, are ideal, so that your uh, your downspouts go into a drain underground and then eventually to the street, so you never have that water pooling up against your foundation. Um, you always want the the grading sloped away from the house, not toward the house. A lot of the times you'll see the sidewalks on the side sloped <clears throat> toward the house. So those are all things that we, we look for that could be causing this settlement. Um, and, and yeah, so as inspectors, we'll, we'll have these drawings for you so that you could um, you can track any future settlement as well. If you want us to go to go back out, we can always take more measurements and see where that settlement is, is happening. Um, okay, we'll go to the next slide. So here um, you could see two pictures of piers. Uh, the one on the left is in poor condition. Um, so these these piers are not only not only have water deterioration between the bricks, but they they also have spalling, which is the deterioration of the surface of the brick. Um, these are in some cases um, you can. You, th these bricks can last a little longer if they're sealed up um, and then just put mortar between the bricks. But in some cases, um, you may have to replace the pier. Um, the one on the right, that is a pier in good condition. Um, I always love to see the actual footing underneath the brick pier, um, especially if it's a continuous footing. Um, a footing basically has the strength of a slab. Um, so if you, if you can see that in its condition and it's continuous around under all the piers, that's always a good sign. Um, if you can't see the footer, you, you can't verify that it's actually there unless the contractor goes out there and digs. Um, so if it's visible, you know it's there and that's why I like to see that. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, difference between rot and insect damage. Mostly termites will eat the wood along the grain. So if you see the damage like on the right, that's usually an indication of termite damage. So definitely get you know a termite inspection, get a, a termite guy out there to see if you actually have um, live activity um, and make sure you know the house stays under contract um, and, and you get them to come out and inspect every year and spot treat as needed. Uh, there are different types of termites too. Um, the, one, the one that does the most serious damage are the subterranean or form formosan termites. And that's actually the damage that you see here. Um, yeah, those are the most aggressive ones and those are very popular here. So if, if, if I walk up to a house and they say it's not under con termite contract, I can almost guarantee that I'm gonna find them. Um, but you'll know um, a way to find termites is they have to come from the ground. So if you see around the piers, a little dirt tunnel going up to the wood structure, um, and you open that tunnel up, you'll typically see the white termites crawling out of it. So always look um, where the ground meets the foundation, um, and that, that's where you can inspect for, for termites. Um, you always want an adequate clearance if it is a slab. Um, an adequate clearance of the foundation. If the siding is too close to the ground, then the termites can enter the property without you even noticing it. So it's very important to keep that proper clearance. Um, now the one on the left is rot. Rot doesn't typically go through the grain. It's, it's usually darker. Um, so it, it's really important to notice the difference so you can know the proper way to, to go about um, finding a solution. Um, but 
rot is caused by water um, and we have lots of, of water in New Orleans so keeping water away from your house is a constant battle. Um, so it, it is um, important to know the difference between these damages. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, the exterior. So we talked a little bit about moisture management. Um, so we talked a little bit about gutters and downspouts. Site, I mean, um, subsurface drainage is ideal. Um, so if you can install that, that would be great. But definitely make sure um, the water is sloped, um, is draining away from the foundation. Um, siding, um, wood siding uh, is obviously vulnerable to rot. Um, what a lot of people are using these days is fiber cement. Um, fiber cement or hardy board. It's, um, it's actually made of cement and it can't, can't rot. It can deteriorate over time, but at a much slower rate. Um, so you just keep it painted and sealed and flashed. Um, windows, wood windows are very common in the historic properties and they're very um, uh, prone to leaking both air and water. Um, a lot of people just tend to paint and seal them shut. Um, but that also um, brings uh, safety issues because you can't safely egress from the home in, in the uh, instance of a fire or emergency. So we always like to see at least one operable window per room. Um, porches and balconies and decks where they connect to the house. As you can see in that picture below, it's a very vulnerable area. I can almost guarantee that there's moisture intrusion at these connections, especially if there isn't flashing, but that's the proper way to flash those connections. Um, and you can see in the picture on the right, that's where the sidewalk um, is sloped toward the house and it's damaged. That's a very um, common thing to see, but that is, um, that is an indication that the rainwater is flowing toward the foundation and can be causing settlement and other damage. Okay, next slide, please. So here's um, a few examples. Um, the picture on the left is a leaking gutter. Um, a lot of times you'll be at a house when it's not raining. So if you see stains um, like this, for example, dark stains at the seams, that's usually an indication that there's a leak there. Copper um, will not deteriorate, but it can still leak. So if you see a turquoise color on the copper, that's an indication of a leak. Um, copper turns that turquoise color whenever it begins to corrode. So um, those are just some things to look for with gutters. Next slide, please. All right, let's move on to electrical. So when you walk up to a house, First thing you want to do is go look at the breaker panel or fuse panel. See if it's breakers or fuses. Fuses um, are the, is the, um, the most or more dated uh, version um, and they're not the safest and a lot of insurance companies don't like to see that. Um, and it's mainly because anyone can change out a fuse um, and they could potentially change it out with the incorrect size. Um, so that's the main issue. Um, so so look to see if you have fuses or breakers. Um, also the type of wiring, um, we have knob and tube, which is you know, one of the first um, electrical wiring. Uh, you have the cloth sheathed, uh, which is the next generation. And then you have today's wiring, which is Romex. Um, ungrounded outlets, um, that's usually um, an indication that you have the older wiring, um, like knob and tube or cloth sheathed. Um, an ungrounded outlet, um, you'll be able to, um, you'll know it's ungrounded if you only see the two slots, not the three slot. Um, we also have these outlet testers that we use, like in that picture below. That's how you can tell if an outlet is wired correctly and if it's grounded. Um, and we also check to see if GFCIs um, are anywhere near water like kitchens, bathrooms, garages, exterior. Those are those outlets with the test and reset buttons. Um, and those are required anywhere near water as a safety feature. Um, it'll trip that circuit if, if water happens to get into it. 
Um, and another thing we look for, um, we like to see um, at least 125 amps uh, for the main service. Um, for the main service amperage, if we see 100 amps, that's usually marginal. Um, although if, if it's a small little single shotgun or a very small house that it has all gas appliances, it may be okay. Um, but with today's, um, today's standards with technology and everything else, um, we would prefer to see at least 125 amps. Um, and I'll, I'll go over to a little, um, little later about different tools that you can use um, at like these outlet testers and like the uh, voltage stick on the right to see if a two slot outlet is live, then you know that you have an older wiring. Uh, but we'll go over that a little later. Uh, okay, next slide. All right, the one on the left, um, that is a fuse panel. So if you see those circular um, screw in fuses, that is the dated system. Um, it is usually can also connected to older wiring too. So just be aware of that. Um, the picture on the right, those are breakers, but those are actually breakers that have been recalled. Um, they're called FPE panels. Um, they were recalled back in the early 2000s for not tripping when they need to. So whenever you see those red breakers and it says stab lock on the panel, beware of that. That panel um, will likely need to be replaced. But luckily, it's only the panel and the breakers that will need to be replaced, not the wiring. All right, next slide. Okay, HVAC. So the first thing you want to look for is the age of the unit. In this climate, the cooling system will go out before the heating system. Um, the, the main tool that I use as a home inspector to determine the age of a system is buildingcenter.org. Um, if you go to the data plate, look at the serial number and, um, and the manufacturer, and you'll be able to determine the age. The, um, the size of the unit will usually be in the model number. Um, but that's a very good tool to determine the age of these systems. Now, the cooling components will typically last no more than 10 or 15 years in this climate. So just be aware of that. They can last longer if they're maintained well and if it's a good manufacturer. Um, but just be aware, be aware of that. Um, and some things to look for. Um, if you're looking at the condenser outside, look at the coil, see if it's dirty or corroded. Um, that's usually an indication of some issues. Um, and also see if you can look at the ductwork, both in the crawl space or the attic. Um, if it's in the crawl space, um, it's likely to be, uh, to be damaged. If it's open, um, rodents look to go in the crawl space and, um, and just tear up the insulation of the ducts. Um, and also it's, it's vulnerable to, to moisture damage as well. Um, another important component to inspect is the condensate system. It's the pan underneath the interior unit, usually in an attic, um, because that can cause a lot of moisture issues. Um, if the pan is rusted, that was an indication that there was a leak, um, possibly an issue with the evaporator coil, could be something as simple as, um, as it being dirty, um, or it could be really rusted and old. Um, so it's important to get these things checked out and, um, and clean, you gotta stay on top of maintenance, um, but also insulating areas, insulating pipes um, and connections that could cause condensation to form, um, which could also drip onto the interior finishes. So insulating the primary line and making sure the ducts are nice and insulated, especially at their connections. Um, they do have make these safety features for the condensate system um, called float and safety switches. Um, they'll, they will actually shut the unit off before water overflows the pan um, or if the line clogs. Okay, next slide. So here's an example of the um, exterior compressor. The one on the left um, is, has a corroded coil. Um, that's usually an indication of age. Um, that's probably a unit that was probably in the early 2000s. It's probably um, past its life expectancy. Um, but we always um, gauge the condition um, and we look at its performance. 
if it's still performing well, then there's no need to replace it. But definitely be prepared to replace it if it's, um, if it's in this condition and aged. Um, and the one on the right, that's one of a um, probably close to brand new unit um, and, and no issues with that one. Okay, next, next slide. All right, let's get, to, get into plumbing. Um, so a lot of uh, very common issue that I see with water supply lines is the galvanized steel lines. Now those rust from the inside out and will slowly restrict the water pressure. Um, it tends to happen first on the hot water side. So if, um, if you see, if you go inside and run the water, if you see rust coming out of the, the, the faucet, that's usually an indication of galvanized steel lines or if you see the hot water pressure is much weaker than the cold, that's also an indication. Um, you can also have old sewer lines. Um, cast iron is, is, was a common material used back then. Um, a lot of the times that can rust, um, crack and split, especially if it's underground and, um, and if tree roots are near it. Um, so we'll, we'll inspect for that, for damage and for leaks. Um, like I mentioned before, if you see soil erosion um, under in the crawl space, sometimes that can be an indication of underground sewer leaks. Um, also, whenever you're running water inside, if there's a really slow drain, that can sometimes be an, an indication of an issue um, with the sewer lines. Okay, next slide. All right, so here's galvanized steel and copper. You can see the picture on the left um, is where they replaced the hot water side first. That's because that went out first. Um, you can see the bottom picture, the galvanize is actually starting to rust through on the outside. And that's when you really know it's time to replace it. Most people will tend to replace the galvanize as they need it, not all at once. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, they'll, they'll, they'll usually replace it with copper or a plastic, newer plastic material called PEX. Um, and you can see on the right where galvanized is connected to copper and they have that dielectric union in between. You never want two metals in contact with one another. So that dielectric union separates those metals and kind of acts, um, it acts as a sacrificial piece so that it doesn't rust the pipe itself. Um, so if you see um, any different types of metal in contact with one another, uh, it, it needs to be corrected um, before leaks happen. Okay, next slide. All right, insulation and ventilation. Um, so first we'll talk about cross ventilation in attics. Um, so if you're looking at a house and you see um, vents, um, you'll see openings, um, either louvered doors, um, gable vents um, on the front of the house, on the back of the house, or you'll see these porch vents like you see on this top picture here. Um, that's allowing air to enter the attic. You want a combination of air entering the attic and exiting the attic to allow that cross ventilation. Um, so you can, there's a lot of ways to go about it. You have gable vents, ridge vents on the roof, the turbine vents porch vents, soffit vents, they have a lot of different options and power vents too. Um, so you definitely want your attic to be well ventilated, not only to extend the life of your roof, but also to help with cooling costs. Um, as far as insulation, um, spray foam is very popular these days. Um, and it's unfortunate that sometimes people uh, will, will hire spray foam um, contractors um, that don't do that great of a job, especially on a historic home. Um, typically, uh, his, like I said before, historic homes are designed to breathe. Um, and if you come in with spray foam um, and seal it up completely, that's when you start to see moisture issues. Um, so you have to choose the correct materials and apply it properly. Uh, so you don't run into these issues. So I would rather see spray foam on a new construction versus a historic home. Um, and if you did choose spray foam, um, you would want to choose closed cell, which is less permeable. 
um, in the crawl space and you would want to choose open cell spray foam which is more porous under the roof. Um, they have other types of insulation too. Um, they have the fiberglass bat insulation like you see in the picture underneath. You really don't want to see that in a crawl space um, mainly because it can still allow moisture to get behind it. Um, and termites um, love to nest in the insulation under the floor because that's where moisture accumulates and anywhere you see moisture and wood you'll likely see termites coming behind uh, so you'll want to prevent that. Um, now ventilation in the crawl space is also important um, whether that be passive ventilation through the piers um, or, or more active ventilation with the powered fan um, either one you, you do need ventilation um, if you don't have ventilation, that'll allow mold and fungus and moisture and then eventually termites. Um, today's standard of the insulation, as far as the thickness, is about 10 inches in an attic. Um, so check the insulation in the attic and see if it's about 10 inches. Um, another thing to keep in mind whenever you insulate an attic is if you have gas appliances up there, if you have gas appliance like a gas furnace or a gas water heater, it needs adequate combustion air. So you definitely, it would be preferred if you didn't have spray foam in an attic with gas appliances. Um, spray foam is designed to completely seal the space without ventilation. Um, so there, there are other ways you can go about it, but it is preferred um, to not have spray foam with gas appliances. All right, next slide, please. Okay, here's an example of some ventilation. Um, people um, over time have gotten creative um, with vents. Um, the one on the left, you can see the lattice. That's where uh, the gable vent is. It's allowing air there. Um, and the one on the right does not have any openings. It's just a window. So keep an eye on those sort of things um, to see if to see where the, the roof vents are. Okay, next slide. All right, interior. So learning how to analyze cracks um, would be really helpful in determining uh, whether it's something serious or not so serious. So if you see cracks um, radiating from windows and doors, that's usually an indication of, of movement. Um, if you see a straight crack, a very straight crack in a wall or a ceiling, that's usually not a serious issue. That's usually just a poorly installed drywall seam. Um, in the floors, if you see cracked floor tiles, if it's just in one tile, it's, it was probably mechanical, maybe something fell on it. But if it goes across multiple tiles, that's usually an indication of movement. Um, also, um, looking at water stains, um, seeing where the water stains are, um, it could be, um, you know, an indication of roof leaks, uh, window leaks, or it could be an indication of condensation from the HVAC in the attic. So you always want to um, keep those things in mind. Um, opening doors and windows is a very easy way to determine if there has been settlement too. Um, if the door opens or swings shut by itself, um, that's usually an indication of movement. Um, or if the door binds on the frame, um, that's usually an indication that the frame has wrapped a little bit. Um, or cracked window panes, especially the transom lights inside, that would be an indication of movement of the frame itself. So um, that could be an indication of movement. Okay, next slide. So here's um, some examples of racked frames. Um, the one on the left, it's very faint. You can't, it's not very obvious, but you can see that at the top rail of that top transom, it's uh, a little bit thinner on the left. Um, so that, that would be an indication of racked frame and movement. Um, and you can see on the bottom too, the bottom rail is a little thinner on the left. So you have to have a really fine eye for these things, but these are things that you want to look for. Um, and the one on the right is, is a perfectly square frame, um, but the, the glass in this transom, if it was cracked, that would be um, an indication of movement. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so I want to leave you with um, a few um, affordable tools, inspection tools. Your five senses are the best tools. Um, you know, make sure you listen out for, for drips or, um, or hollowed um, walls or wood or things like that. And, uh, or, you know, obviously a visual, um, look out for all the things that we went over, all the pictures that we looked through. Um, and smell, if you smell sewer gases, um, if you smell mildew smell, that's usually an indication of moisture issues. Um, GFCI outlet tester, that's the little orange tool on the right. And get the uh, three slot and GFCI tester would be best. Um, that'll tell you how the outlet is wired. Um, voltage stick, that's the one on, on the bottom. Um, that's where you could uh, test wires or test two slot outlets to see if they're live. Um, 12 inch screwdriver, that's how we probe the structural members in the crawl space in the attic. If you can probe um, at least a third of the way through the piece of wood, then it's structurally damaged. Um, and a moisture meter. Um, I like the, the pinless type. Um, I get the Ryobi one. Um, it, it also um, tests multiple surfaces. If you have at least 20% moisture in a surface, then that's likely an active leak. Um, so you have all of these tools that you could um, you can bring with you and, and get a very good idea of, of what you're getting into. Okay, next slide. And this will be um, my last slide. These are some really good resources for you. Um, if you want to get quotes on these issues that you may find or your home inspector finds, go to repairpricer.com. You can email them our inspection report and they'll send you their report with um, very detailed, um, so they'll have each issue and uh, they'll have a quote for each item um, based on local contractors um, work. So they say that they're 98% accurate. Um, so very worth it. Um, in my opinion. Um, Inspectopedia is also a really good resource. Um, you can research pretty much any issue that you'll find on a home um, and you'll find lots of, um, lots of information there. Build Facts um, is basically like Carfax, but for a home. Um, you could find all of the, um, the uh, documented permits that were filed on the house um, and um, typically, most of the New Orleans homes will have this. Um, some Metairie locations, um, maybe some West Bank locations, but mainly New Orleans. Um, but yeah, definitely a good resource um, as well. Another good uh, textbook, um, the Home Reference Book, if you want to learn everything about a house. It's a very good good book to have. Um, and if you want a nice, um, easy to read illustrated book, um, to tell you about code. Um, today's current code, Code Check Complete, is a very good uh, resource as well. Uh, we refer to that often. Um, but that'll be it for me. Thank you so much, Gabby. That was great. That was so thorough. Um, I want to encourage everyone now to send in your questions, either via the chat box or the Q&A box. And I can relay all of your questions to Josh and Gabby um, over the next few minutes. So let me check out what we got here. We actually don't have any questions yet. Come on, people, send them in. I know you've got questions. I know you've got them. Send them in, chat box or Q&A box. Okay, I've got one question um, and that's for Josh. Josh, you gave us, you know, a very thorough recap of what the world looks like right now due to COVID. Um, would you say that it's a buyer's or a seller's market right now? That is a fantastic question. Um, I hate to say this, but it's kind of both. Um, I know that's not very definitive. Um, the, the spring, I keep saying the spring market, I'm sorry, we really didn't have one. The summer, spring, summer market, um, we went back into sort of multiple offer situations because really once everybody just woke up, everybody went at it and, uh, you would find a good pro I mean, basically on the whole good, really great properties always have multiple offers that go for asking. 
but um, we had a multiple offers this this spring uh, this summer oof, that was uh, that made it more of a seller's market because they could get away with more because they knew they had more buyers. Um, I do have to say this though, uh, on the flip side of that, some of the sellers are really getting beaten up on inspections because people are putting in over asking offers. So it, it's, it's really a combination of the two. I wouldn't say we've definitely, I would say if it's possible, we're, we're kind of just one day versus the next. Um, I'm, I'm sorry not to really give you a, a, a knock it out of the park answer, but it, it, it's, it's pretty much we're in between. I mean, I, I kind of am scared to say this, but I do predict prices are going to go down and settle a little bit this fall. That's really, really good advice or just thoughts. Thank you, Josh. Gabby, what kind of damage would scare you the most as a potential historic home buyer? So if it's a historic home and it's a raised house, um, I would be most concerned if I saw major settlement um, with the peers, um, with the footings um, in particular, um, because that would have to involve actually replacing the pier rather than just repairing it. Um, and that can get kind of costly. Um, that could run anywhere from two to maybe $500 per pier. Um, in an average size house, you may have 30 peers, so that can really get expensive. Um, but yeah, that would be for, you know, historic homes, most historic homes are, are peer foundations, so. That's great, and kind of as, not a follow-up, but a related question. Um, Janetta wonders, is it always better to stabilize a foundation rather than to level it? What if the flooring is not level? So most people can live with a little, um, a little unlevelness. If it starts to affect um, your daily um, living um, and furniture, um, that's when you may want to think about leveling. Um, if it's really out of level, um, really noticeable, um, and you know, really affecting the um your your daily living you could get a shoring contractor out there and and try to level it for you but just keep in mind that can damage the drywall and the flooring and may involve other repairs so that's why most people tend to stabilize versus level um, but if you plan on doing a major renovation it may be a good time to level it before um, you know you do refinish the inside great thank you Josh, I have two foreclosure related questions. The first is simply, how do you find foreclosures? And then the second person wonders that if there are people, local companies, um, maybe realtors or other sorts of consultants that, that help people through the foreclosure sale process, either the sheriff's foreclosure sale or others where properties are sold. Sure. Um, there are a few websites out there that do focus on foreclosures. Um, the one that pops to mind is called Hubzoo. Um, that's more of a, uh, like a, a bidding process, an auction, if you will. The um, Orleans Parish really doesn't have a ton of foreclosures, to be honest with you. Um, keep in mind when uh, the whole banking crisis happened and foreclosures were happening everywhere. We were just coming out of Katrina. So we, we had our, our world was totally different then. So the rest of the country, people were losing their houses left, right, and center. We were just trying to figure out how to fix our houses to move back into them. So we kind of missed that um, time, if you will. Uh, but on the whole, um, some banks, when they uh, file foreclosure against a property, they will give it to a real estate agent to sell them. Uh, I personally prefer to do a foreclosure with another agent because I have somebody to pick up the phone and call directly to see how the foreclosure process is proceeding with the bank. Sometimes when you get involved with some of the websites or um, a sheriff sale, anything like that, you're not always necessarily always talking to the same person. So one day you're talking to Tim in some part of the bank and Sally in the next part of the bank, they sort of pass the file around. That can become very, very frustrating. I know as a real estate agent, that's very frustrating because they own the same set of eyes on that file all the time. 
And the number you called yesterday is not the number you're going to call tomorrow. So it's a tricky process. It certainly does happen. But if you could pick the ideal, so to speak, I would say go with somebody who is at least the foreclosures being represented by an agent, because at least you have somebody to call and at least you have at least help trying to figure out where you are in the process. That's great. Thank you. Gabby, I have one for you. Um, mm -hmm. Can spray foam add rigidity or stability to older wood flooring? Um, if you use closed cell spray foam underneath um, a historic home, um, it probably could add a little bit of stability or structural integrity to the floor, but the other issues that it can cause, um, in my opinion, um, uh, aren't really worth it. Um, so if you have spray foam underneath the subfloor, and let's say you have a plumbing leak above the floor, that plumbing leak will not show itself until it's done an extensive amount of damage. Um, and also a material that you can't remove um, is not ideal. Um, even, well, for historic homes, I, I've learned that it, it can actually void tax credits too. Um, so that's something to keep in mind with historic homes and spray foam. Um, but if you absolutely want to insulate under a floor of a historic home, um, try to go with something that's removable, but you can also seal it very well. So something like, um, you know, if you want to put fiberglass between the, the floor joists, but then come back with a rigid foam board below the joists and tape all the seams. Now you have a sealed system that's also removable. Um, that's, that's, that's always recommended, especially on a historic home. Great answer, thank you. David says that a friend's old house has at least five different interior door styles. Are there good resources out there for interior historic architectural details like door styles, molding profiles, et cetera, to know what's appropriate for a particular age of home? Well, I'd say that the PRC is actually a pretty good resource for that. So you can give us a call. Um, I was say, you're yeah. watching the right show. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Seriously, Davis, get, David, give us a call. Um, we'll put, I'll put the number um, to our front desk in your chat box and um, your friend can call. And, and I'd say, you know, unless you all have any extra answers that um, there are definitely some style guides that we can steer you to. If we can't help you figure out exactly what you're looking for over the phone, um, we have several style guides at the PRC. We can make copies for you or you can surely find those titles um, in a local bookstore. Y'all have anything to add to that? <laughs> uh, we, we do have a two uh, architectural uh, salvage yards in the city that there's one um, called the Bank on Felicity Street and then there's Rickas on, uh, in Mid City. I'm sorry, I can't think of what street. But uh, they're actually very organized. I, I, I really kind of like walking through them even if I don't need anything. It's just sort of fun. But um, they might be, you know, once you find the style of door that fits the era of the home, they'll be, totally be able to help you. Great point. Great point. Those, those stores are fascinating. They have wonderful treasures. Um, the Green Project also is a great salvage store. Um, they, they don't focus as much on, you know, ornate architectural pieces. Um, it's more like if you want a toilet, you go, <laughs> you know, or just a general door or something. They have lots of paint. Um, it's a fantastic resource. So that's a great place to hunt too. All right, the last question, how does one go about trying to corral people in a neighborhood to assist in removing the blight? We do that a lot at PRC too. <laughs> um, I'd say um, that the key is to organize. If there's not already a neighborhood association, perhaps the neighbors can band together to try and form one. That is some, a way to really get the attention of city officials um, to try and make improvements to one's neighborhood. Um, calling 311 to report a blighted property as an individual works to a degree, but when you have a whole neighborhood association advocating on behalf of a neighborhood, that is so much more powerful. And I know that because neighborhood associations work with the PRC all the time on blighted property remediation. Obviously what we want is we want blighted properties to be put back into commerce. So if they're owned by an absentee landlord, someone who doesn't even live there and they're falling apart, um, 
you know, that property needs to be adjudicated and sold at tax sale or, or something so that someone else can buy that home and take care of it. Um, what we don't want is we don't want to displace people. If there are people living there who need help, let's hook them up with um, agencies who can do that help. The PRC has a program called Revival Grants, Rebuilding Together New Orleans. Josh is on their board, um, can do home repairs, St. Bernard Project, where Gabby um, hails from for a while. Um, these are organizations who can all help um, homeowners who need help. Um, we don't want to see buildings demolished because as you can see from Josh's beautiful presentation, um, all these blighted homes can be breathed new life into them and have, you know, another 200 years ahead of them. Um, Josh, what do you have to add? Um, I mean, I'm just a huge fan of, of renovating in general. I, to me, that's one of my favorite parts of my job. Uh, I, I, find, I find that I'm so fortunate to, to work and live in this city. Um, I mean, I'm not going to knock New Jersey, but <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, it, it is a lot of sprawl there and a lot of sort of cookie cutter houses and it's a lot of concrete and strip malls and I'm sorry, New Jersey, please don't hate me. But, um, you know, it's just so unique here. I just, I can't Im imagine living anywhere else. And I moved here after living in Rome, Italy, because once I came, I mean, I'd been coming here to see friends the whole time, but once I had the opportunity to move here, I was so excited about it because it just felt, it's just, it's got such a great flavor that, that, I mean, please help renovate these houses. Let's just keep, the, the city's a gem. Let's, let's just keep shining. Beautifully said. <laughs> well, Gabby and Josh, thank you so much. You both made excellent presentations tonight. I, my, my, my brain is so full of information in the best possible way. So thank you both so much for sharing your expertise. Um, with our viewers. To all of you watching tonight, thanks for sticking with us. Um, we really enjoyed having you. Uh, please consider supporting the PRC by becoming a member or making a donation. Again, our website is prcno.org. And be sure to keep up with us on social media, sign up for our e-blast so that you'll never miss an upcoming class or tour. Get ready, we're making our holiday home tour virtual this year. It's gonna be phenomenal. So you'll wanna know all about it. Sign up for email updates and other, um, and follow us on social media to stay apprised of what's going on. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Bye, see you.